Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Barr, and I am a professor of history here at Lone Star College, Kingwood. And we'd like to welcome you to another of our author talks in our Curious Minds, uh, previously Writer, Speakers, and Ideas series. And I'd like to share a few housekeeping matters with you first, and then we'll get right to the talk. Okay. So, as I said a second ago, this is a part of our Curious Minds series. Lately, because of COVID, we have had to move off of our campus to have these talks virtual, but in many ways that has worked out quite well because we've been able to have people from all over the country. Even last year, we had someone from London that gave a talk on uh, a forgotten battle of World War II, one of the last battles of World War II, Eric Lee. And there, of course, is a picture of our beautiful campus and uh, take heart students. We will meet there once again. Um, this is a series that's premised on uh, something that's really very simple, and that is the idea that talking about books is as important educationally as are the books and the subjects themselves. And today we have Mike Van on hand to talk about his book, The Great Hanoi Rat Hunt. More on Mike in a second, but I wanted to preview what we have in a couple of weeks. We have Ryan Bourne, an economist at the Cato Institute, who is gonna talk about really a couple of questions on his book, Economics and One Virus. What can economics tell us about COVID-19? And what can COVID-19 teach us about economic thinking? So we're very uh, pleased to look forward to that. And that will be Friday, October the 29th at 12 p.m. And I have read that book and it is quite good. But for today, we have Mike Van on hand, as I said a second ago. And now that I've introduced the series, let's talk about what our uh, next hour is going to look like. Mike will talk somewhere between, usually this is true for every speaker, 35, 40, 45 minutes. And as he, think, as he does talk, think about uh, some of these questions. Why did he decide to write this history in graphic form? Uh, what inspired him to do this kind of work? What travel did he have to do? Of course, if he doesn't address these questions, you can obviously ask them afterwards. Uh, why did the French believe that their imperialism or their form of it benefited the Vietnamese? Why were they ultimately in Vietnam for selfish or unselfish reasons? Uh, was the rat hunt the ultimate answer to stopping or containing the plague in Vietnam? Why or why not? And then why is the story of the rat hunt relevant for Americans today, or for that matter, even for the history of the United States? And again, if Mike doesn't address all these questions, you can ask him in the chat. Okay. Oh boy. Videos, bandwidth, not available. So during the talk, uh, think about the questions you want to ask and type them in the chat. And after the talk, we'll have student, faculty, staff, and community members uh, ask questions. So <clears throat> to introduce Mike, uh, Michael G. Van is a professor of world history at California State University, Sacramento. Raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, he earned his PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz. His research interests include the French colonial empire and Southeast Asia during the eras of imperialism and the Cold War. He's received three Fulbright Awards for research in France, Indonesia, and Cambodia. Uh, Mike, I might need your help with pronunciation here for just a second. Uh, he's taught at Metropolitan Business College, Hanoi. And what are the next two there? Universitas, how do I? Uh, Universitas Gajamada and Panasatra University of Cambodia. Okay, great. And East China Normal University. Van is a host for the New Books and History podcast, and it, I'm sure that you'll be interested. I'm going to be interested in listening to that and a contributor to the diplomat. And uh, is it Jacobin or Jacobin, Mike? Jacobin. Jacobin, right. His current research project is on the representation of Cold War era mass violence in Indonesia, Vietnamese, and Cambodian museums. 
So without any further ado, Mike, I'm gonna turn this over to you and make you the pre presenter. Uh, okay, I've gotta stop sharing first. Okay, so uh, greetings everyone. Um, uh, apologies, um, I the, the slides I have are updated. This is the Curious Minds talk. Uh, uh, the name has been changed. And I come to you from Cal uh, California, and I I come in the name of fostering California Texas relations. Um, we lost uh, both uh, Joe Rogan and Elon Musk to you, um, so hopefully we can <laughs> foster relations. So could you hit the next slide, please? Yes. Great. So um, the title for this talk is "Finding History in the Strangest Strangest of Places," or how I came to study sewer rats in Vietnam and write a comic history about the Frenchmen that wanted to kill them and how this matters today. Um, next slide. This is a talk in three parts. First, I'll talk about um, my journey as a young historian, finding the, the rat hunt. Uh, second, I'll say a few words on um, finding graphic history and why I chose to present this in a really unusual academic format. And then finally, some lessons for today, because um, you know, timing is everything in your academic career and publishing a book on pandemics a year before a global pandemic was excellent timing, right? So <laughs> I, I was, you know, a couple of years ago when I was working on this, I was writing about pandemics and talking about them and presenting papers and nobody cared. Well. <laughs> now, so, suddenly, my uh, all sorts of people are finding interest in this subject. So, next slide. So, any any graphic, any comic formats, got to start with an origin story, right? You know, Superman origin story, Batman origins, what have you. So, my origin story and the origin story of the Great Hanoi Rat Hunt is I was doing doctoral research on the history of power in the French Empire. I was working with Tyler Stovall, who went on to become president of the AHA, the American Historical Association. And he's a traditional urban historian, and I was being trained as a traditional urban historian. Um, my dissertation project focused on the French impact on French Hanoi, and I was looking at the colonial transformation of the city. In particular, I was looking at the sociological concept of the dual city, that is a city that is divided primarily along uh, racial lines. Most of the cases are racially divided cities. So cities divided in two, but have very unequal power relationships. And in particular, in the colonial setting, um, the dual city is characterized by uh, the way in which white supremacy is literally built into the shape of the city uh, in infrastructure and so forth. But I also wanted to explore things like daily life in the colonial city and questions of power and vulnerability. And one of my working theses was that while the French colonial state presented itself as very powerful, it was actually very vulnerable in a number of ways. Um, in Russian history, there's a story of the Potemkin Vils, the fake cities that um, uh, Potemkin built to impress uh, uh, Tsarina Katerina the Great. And in some ways, the, the colonial cities of the empire looked really powerful but if you look behind the scenes, they're actually very vulnerable. So next slide. Uh, going about the research, I was doing the traditional approaches. Uh, my advisor, again, was a prominent urban historian. So I was using traditional social history, looking at a lot of um, sort of hard data, um, government records, city plans, maybe some memoirs of architects and officials, um, lots of discussions of streets and roads and um, building the infrastructure, lots of tax records, which boy, that was boring. Lots and lots of tax records. I was really dreading tax records. Super important for understanding where money is going in, in urban history and, and also who's paying for it. But boy, is that boring. And then maps, 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 and more maps. And in hindsight, the maps were probably really important for my thinking because I began to think more visually about the city. Um, all, so let's look at a couple of these maps. So the next slide is a map of Hanoi before the French uh, seized it in 1882. And what you can see is that there's this little triangle uh, 
of uh, land on the banks of the Red River, and that's where the Vietnamese population lived, the civilian population. And to the south of that block of land were um, various temples and religious and, and Confucian uh, structures, Mandarin testing grounds and so forth. And to the west, you see sort of that flower shape and that's actually a, a Vauban, a European style fort that was built in 1802. And that's where the, uh, the army um, would be and the government officials. So uh, the, the, pop, the civilian population lives in that little triangle of land right next to the word fleuve, uh, the French word for, for river. So on the next slide, we can see that uh, it's a little small here, but just uh, alongside the river there, that area is preserved, but um, the, big, the big fort has been torn down. And then the, um, to the south of the city, you see it, these very straight lines and things that look like a, what we would recognize as a modern Western city. It looks like Chicago or something or, or San Francisco with these very straight lines and, and big blocks. And that was the French city. And that's the city the French built for themselves um, and where they lived. And so they created a dual city on either side of this lake right in the center of Hanoi. To the north is the Vietnamese section. To the south is the French section. So next slide. What was fantastic is that my dissertation was really easy to do. Um, it was pretty darn easy to demonstrate Hanoi was this colonial dual city. You had a very different French city from a very different Vietnamese city, but they're both part of the overall urban unit that is Hanoi. Uh, next slide. So uh, in, you can show the, uh, the dual city in terms of disparities in wealth. Um, the Vietnamese section was rather poor compared to the French section and due to colonial taxation policies and, and French um, uh, intervention in the economy. Uh, in many ways, the Vietnamese standard of living actually declined a bit, especially for the lower classes. And um, their uh, wealth was dramatically different from the wealth of the French city. And the other, the other slide there, you see the, uh, near the image, you see the French um, buildings, which look so dramatically different. Um, small wooden thatch huts versus big stone buildings. Uh, next slide. And you see these in the dual city, you see a radical disparity in population density. So that that little one third of Hanoi where the Vietnamese and Chinese population live in that third of the surface area, probably 90% of the population of Hanoi lived. And on the, um, you see that first image there on the slide is a very crowded uh, street scene from the Vietnamese section of Hanoi. And then in the French section, there's these big wide streets, big blocks, um, and only about 5% of the city lives on another third of the land. The other third was devoted to military and government administrative functions. But my point here is that there's this dramatic uh, difference in population density, which is key to sort of the urban experience. You go into the Vietnamese section, it's overwhelmingly crowded. You go into the French section and there's relatively few people and not using land is a way to demonstrate power. You know, think about a crowded uh, neighborhood in, um, in Houston versus uh, suburbs where people have big lawns and, and yards, the streets are wider, there's grass medians and so forth. So in this difference in population density, you see um, the difference uh, differences of the either parts of the colonial dual city. And my argument was that this is a way in which the white French colonizers were literally building in white supremacy into the infrastructure of the city. Uh, next slide. So the, the project was easy to do, but I was still really unsatisfied. Um, one of the authors whose theories I was working with was Janet Abula Gold, and she wrote a book on Rabat, Morocco, which she characterized as the colonial city being urban apartheid, the sense that there's this clear division between um, white and non-white, uh, that they're 
the the city is you know in in the in American history we call it separate but equal right which is separate but actually far from equal but the, the, there's this firm dividing line between the the white French colonizing population and the Asian colonized population but other theorists such as the geographer David Harvey or the historian David Prochaska who worked on colonial Algeria they show that daily life is full of interactions and encounters. Um, that that idea of urban apartheid, this firm division, these barriers in the city, like like the Berlin Wall, right, cutting the city in half, that's not the way cities work. People are constantly transgressing these lines. So if you look at this image below, this is a scene from the French neighborhood. But if um, you look carefully at the image, everybody in the photograph is Vietnamese. So even though we're in the French city, during the day, lots of Vietnamese workers came in. And uh, you can see there's Vietnamese rickshaw pullers, there's Vietnamese office workers. So the city is actually full of all sorts of interactions. I also found in my research on the behavior, of, particularly of uh, French men, is that they were frequently going into the Vietnamese section of the city at night to go to bars, to go to opium dens, or to other things, which I'll leave your imagination to. But the urban experience has this constant transgression of the color line. And so that, that was, I was kind of frustrated because I, I couldn't answer these questions. Um, next slide, please. So it, it left me with this, this puzzle. How do I read the reality of daily life in the colonial city? What did the French think of their city? How did they experience the city? How did the French experience white supremacy? Um, what were also what were the limits of their power, their control? Um, what were the limits of white supremacy? So I was really frustrated with these questions. Uh, next slide. And then there was a more fundamental problem for me is that traditional social and urban research can get really boring. So remember all those tax records and all those maps of urban planning? I mean, I love maps, but there's only so many maps of streets and water lines and electrical poles and so forth. So whenever I get bored, um, I've got a curious mind. So I start reading and I start reading other things, um, not things necessarily related to what I'm supposed to be reading. And I read around to find inspiration. And that's a, a little sub theme that I want to address. Read broadly, read outside your discipline, find inspiration from other fields of study. So next slide. This is an image from the book and it's, I, I love this image, it's a little cheeky and it's, it's me not doing my work, but daydreaming. And I'm thinking about things I've read. One was uh, an article about a cockfight in Bali Another was about um, a, um, a Renaissance Italian miller who was put on trial by the Italian Inquisition and eventually burned at the stake for heresy. Another was an article about um, uh, apprentices in Paris who uh, would kidnap their master's cats. They were, they were printers, the printing master's cats, kidnap the cats, put them on trial for witchcraft and then execute them. And they thought it was hilarious. It's this bizarre story. And then finally, I thought about a book I read about sewers. So next slide. What I'm referencing is classic examples of thick description and micro history. And thick description comes from cultural anthropology and um, the, the key, um, or sort of foundational piece in thick description and culture, cultural anthropology it's by Clifford Geertz, and it's his notes on a Balinese cockfight. And in this article, he talks about going to a cockfight in Bali in, the, um, in the, I think, the late 1950s or early 1960s. And um, he reads every detail of this experience of the cockfight to find meaning. And it's a way of teasing out larger meaning, answering those questions that were troubling me from uh, from this experience. Carlo Ginsburg's uh, The Cheese and the Worms is the story of that Renaissance mill worker. Robert Darton, a great historian of uh, France, an American who writes about France, he wrote this book, uh, The Great uh, Cat Massacre. 
and um, all of these have uh, all of these engage in the history of culture or mentalité. Uh, we keep it in French just to be pretentious. Um, this history of mentalité, uh, and and I, I realized that was that was what I was would be useful theoretically to answer the questions I wanted to ask. The urban history, the social history, good, good, but it wasn't getting at sort of the lived experience. All of these works use very creative source material. They're very unusual stories that catch your eye, a cockfight, a cheese mill, or a miller who has this bizarre cosmology, uh, guys murdering their boss's cats. Um, and they all do history from below, um, meaning studying the people in the lower reaches of the social hierarchy and social power and what their experience is rather than just studying the great men of history, you know, be it Alexander the Great or Napoleon or whatever. These are studying sort of the average people to again get at that lived experience. And then next slide. And there was another book I read that was literally history from below. And this was Donald Reed's really wonderful book, Paris Sewers and Sewermen. And it's a history of of the Parisian sewers and the people that worked in the sewers. And it's literally history from below, pardon the joke, but I, I have a PhD in dad jokes. Um, and um, what, the, what Reed shows is the importance of health and disease management in French urban history. And that the French really saw management of diseases as central to the project of modernity. And that the sewers uh, really could serve as a larger metaphor for France's transformation in the 19th century. And I had an aha moment, uh, next slide, and I realized I've been reading a lot about sewers in Hanoi. And I realized Hanoi's sewers were a great symbol of modernity. They embodied what the French called la mission civilisatrice, the civilizing mission, which is sort of like the French version of the white man's burden, which many of these colonial officials sincerely believed that they were civilizing the people they conquered. Did the people want it or not? Or not? No, they didn't ask that. It was, mm -hmm. it was civilization was coming at the barrel of a gun. You know, this is again, 19th century, early 20th century colonial ideology. But many of these French officials were true believers that they were going to modernize Vietnam. However, the sewers showed the racial inequality, the dual city. Because guess who gets good sewers and guess who gets bad sewers? In the French neighborhood, they've got fantastic sewers, state-of-the-art, very modern sewers. They've got flush toilets. They've got running water. They've got great urban infrastructure. But in the Vietnamese section, uh, they didn't even really have sewers. They had drainage ditches, and people would still throw night soil in the street, their, their, their waste um, uh, from, you know, biological functions, shall we, shall we say, throw that in the street, it would get washed down in the gutters. Um, they did not have running water in their homes. Uh, the French put in fountains where every morning people would go with buckets to get fresh water, but it's a radical inequality in access to urban infrastructure. And then I found that the uh, French sewers also show a failure of the colonial project, because uh, what I'm going to talk about is they accidentally introduced disease. Even though the sewers were supposed to eliminate disease, they actually introduced disease. And then I found the dossier. And I found the dossier, uh, next slide, again, because I was bored. <laughs> uh, even though I was excited about reading sewers, there's only so much you can read about sewers in the archives. And in the French archives, you could um, request 10 dossiers a day. So 10 folders or cartons a day. And um, just to entertain myself, I would try and find a crazy dossier, something with a, a surprising name. And I saw, um, uh, now many of you in the audience may be surprised to hear this, but there was a time when libraries were organized with something that we called card catalogs. Mm -hmm. They were actual physical pieces of paper that believe this or not, you would touch with your fingers. This is before computers. And you could go, you'd have to go through the cards one by one to find something. This is this is you know medieval kind of technology, right? Now it's all computerized and digitized. So what I would do is as I'm looking for tax records, I'd look around for odd sounding things, which I would find by chance because I have 
a curious mind, right? And I saw, I'd always find some crazy sounding dossier. And I'd, I'd, that would be one of my 10 dossiers I'd request. And so I saw one called Destruction of Animals in the City. And okay, well, that, that will be fun to read at 2.30 in the afternoon on a beautiful day in Provence when I'm in the archives and I could be drinking pastilles from the Cour Mirabeau. So my, my, li my little treat for the exciting life of a historian is read the crazy dossier, right? So I order that dossier one day and it comes. Destruction of animals in the city. No other explanation. And I, and I can see it's got about 100 sheets of paper in it. I open it up. Uh, next slide. And the first page is this um, form that says uh, yesterday on April what, 26, 95 rats were killed in the first arrondissement, the first neighborhood of Hanoi, and 72 rats were killed in the other neighborhood. And I said, okay. <laughs> Never seen anything like that. That's kind of odd. Uh, I flipped the page. So next slide. Few, uh, and it, there's these uh, pages for every day for months. And so a few days later, they're killing 436 rats in one neighborhood and 3,284 in the other for a grand total of 3,723 rats. Wow, that's a lot of rats, right? Crazy dossier is kind of fun. So next slide, the numbers start to go up dramatically. So we're looking at thousands of rats in each neighborhood in the city. Uh, next slide, they really shoot up. So we start talking about 4,000 rats killed a day, 7,000 rats killed a day, up to 15,000 rats killed in one day. Uh, next slide, the most successful day for the French, but um, with all due respect to our rodent friends, the darkest day for the history of Hanoi's rat population was um, uh, on June 13th, or June 12th, rather, uh, where 20,114 rats were killed in a single day. And I'm sitting there in the archives going, wow, they're killing a lot of rats. What the heck is going on here? Yeah. And at, as I get to the end of the dossier, next slide, in the space of three days, it goes from 16,000 rats to 40,000 rats to zero rats. And then the dossier is closed. Nothing else to explain it. So what, what the heck did I just read? So I promptly made a big chart. So on the next page, next slide, just started writing down all these rat kills. Uh, next, next slide, totaling all these rats um, that are killed. Uh, next slide, this is from the, the graphic history. Uh, my fellow graduate students thought I was totally crazy because I was obsessed with this like three month period where the French, the French are killing thousands, tens of thousands of rats a day. Um, I was convinced that there was some sort of larger meaning for this. Um, what it would be, I wasn't sure. And I still couldn't even figure out what, what had actually happened. And it took several years of research going to different archives in southern France, in the colonial archives, and Marseille, in the medical archives um, from the colonial era, up to the um, military archives in Paris, where I had to put on a nice suit, um, and then off to Vietnam, where I went into the what was left of the old colonial archives, uh, where I actually encountered some rats lurking around the archives, perhaps the descendants of the rats I was uh, I was studying. So next slide. What, what I found is that the French had created an unintended health crisis. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the French neighborhood, and you see these big, wide streets, and they built the state-of-the-art sewer system. Um, and that what happened is the, um, the state-of-the-art sewer system was a wholly new ecosystem in Vietnam. Um, subterranean, no predators, uh, full of waste and filth, all the things rats love. But um, something else happened. The French built rail lines and established steamship communication with southern China. And that allowed for an invasive species of brown rats to come into Hanoi. And those rats, when they arrived in Hanoi, um, they'd never lived in Vietnam before. They'd never made their way down there. And they initially didn't find the conditions they like to live in because brown rats like to go down. 
Uh, black rats like to go up in your attic. Brown rats go into the crawl space below your house. Well, they found the sewer system. So these invasive species jump off the French trains, jump off the French ships, go into the sewer system, and where they find everything rats love. Um, filth, waste, no predators, um, and they start to do what rats love to do is make more rats. And before you knew it, this sewer system, which was supposed to provide urban hygiene, was literally overflowing with rats. They're coming out of the manholes. There's reports of rats climbing up the sewer pipes and climbing out of the toilets in the French uh, villas. Well, this is this is we can't we can't allow this to happen, right? Uh, but something really ironic happens, and that in uh, next slide, in the Vietnamese neighborhood where they did not have these modern sewer systems, they didn't have a problem with these black rats because the ecosystem had not been created. So here I, I see this uh, this illustration of the power and vul vulnerability question that I was so interested in. And then what I found is that not only was it a concern that the rats were coming into Hanoi, because just having rats crawling out of your, tour, your sewer is um, a technical term here, but it's yucky, <laughs> it's gross to have a rat climbing out of your sewer or climbing out of your toilet, but the French had been uh, French physicians had been discovering that rats and rat fleas were the key vector in the spread of the bubonic plague. And we're in the beginning of the third bubonic plague pandemic in the 1890s. Oh. And they're going to bring the plague into Hanoi. And the French have inadvertently created the ideal way for the plague to be moved around the world railways and steamships. Rats can be moved quick enough to survive the journey and jump out and, and spread the plague through their fleas. Also, they created this new urban infrastructure so the rats could dive into the sewers and reproduce. And so the, the plague hits Hanoi, and some of the first cases are French, French who are exposed to this invasive rat species with the plague that's coming in from southern China. And the French attitude towards disease was that disease was a problem of the colonized of the Vietnamese. So it really challenged the French sense of power and what they were doing with their urban infrastructure. Um, and so they set about trying to kill all the rats. Um, so next slide. So I set about um, trying to figure out how they were trying to kill the rats and using, using this uh, as a case study of thick description. And then I found that it's actually a really fun and rich story because we have the irony of the sewers creating the health crisis. Uh, we have the massacre, what I call rat or what I call eratication. Again, dad jokes, eratication. Um, yeah. Professor Ball Bar is in pain with that pun. Um, but I found no, also it's good. <laughs> I found also a really insightful things about labor issues. And initially the Vietnamese sewer workers refused to be become rat killers. They said, no, you've trained us to be sewer construction workers. We are now skilled laborers. Killing rats is beneath us. So there was a labor revolt of the colonized uh, Vietnamese, which was really fascinating. And then I found that um, the way that the French tried to kill the rats, and this was the source of all those dossiers of rat kills, is they put out a bounty on the rats. Initially, four pennies for every rat that uh, was killed, but um, uh, something quickly happened um, at the police department because you're supposed to bring the dead rat into the police department. Is as the numbers start to crack a thousand rats a day, the police department doesn't want a thousand dead rats in their office, so they say just cut off the tail and bring in the tail of the rat you killed, and that goes great for three months. Twenty thousand tails come in a day. We're going to kill all the rats until someone realizes that the Vietnamese are catching rats, cutting off their tails, and then letting the rats go away, went away to make more rats. But it gets worse. They find rat farms in the suburbs of Hanoi. And then they find that there's a, there's a uh, northern Vietnam-wide underground smuggling network of bringing rats to the city. So the whole purpose was to get rid of the rats, but they're actually increasing the number of rats in Hanoi. Um, by the way, I know we lost Joe Rogan to Texas, 
but uh, last year, Joe Rogan mentioned my research on his podcast. I'm not a big Joe Rogan fan, but my uh, all of my friends who are immediately started texting me going, dude, you're on Joe Rogan. And, but he didn't mention my name, Ugh, Rogan. Um, but I, I could have made it big. I could have made it big. <laughs> anyway, so the French discover that they that things just turned out to be a catastrophe. So I published this initially as a journal article, expecting, you know, a couple dozen people to read it. Um, but then it made it into the popular media. Freakonomics picked it up. I was on Freakonomics. I was on a number of public radio shows. Um, uh, the article started to be taught in colleges and high schools. A little country in Asia called India uh, plagiarized the article for uh, chapter three of their 10th grade world history textbook. Uh, if you find it's the English language textbook, you'll find it. It's my research. Did they footnote me? No. Um, and so I realized the story um, had could have a wider audience. I thought about doing it as a traditional monograph, but then I realized that I um, that, that Oxford had this graphic history series. So next slide. And I realized that putting it into the graphic or comic format could do a lot more. I'm going to go through a bunch of slides very quickly now and just sort of give you a couple of quick reasons for why I went with the graphic history. Um, first off, one of my pet peeves, don't call it a graphic novel. A novel is a work of fiction. This is graphic history. This is serious stuff, right? So graphic history or graphic narrative history. So the first slide. Or the next slide. Yeah. So the story of the rat hunt is really quirky and funny and weird, and that works great in the graphic format. Uh, you look at successful graphic histories, and they've got these interesting hooks in the plot. Um, next slide. And the, um, the graphic format is really easy to do urban history. Um, what I accomplish in these two pages here would normally take me 10 to 20 pages of conventional prose. So putting the images in there, I can illustrate, I can show rather than say. And for a good screenwriting, right, it's always show don't tell so i could show what's going on uh, next slide i could demonstrate locality give a real sense of what perspective was like what it was like to be in these different positions in the city using images photographs and so forth and and having the artist illustrate them uh, next slide i could also talk about the um the various uh imperial symbols which are so important in the colonial city and their, their failures or misinterpretations. And um, I, I talk about this statue, which is really important for the French self-image, because this is one of the, the French heroes, but the statue is really offensive to the Vietnamese because it's a Frenchman with a Vietnamese man cowering at his feet. And I could explain the story. And then if you look through the book, there's references to that statue, visual references. So the graphic format is great for these sort of callbacks. Uh, next slide. And it can show that um, the real ironies of some of these, uh, the difference of, of the colonial symbols and the, the subaltern or the colonized reading. The French put a Statue of Liberty in the middle of the city they conquered. And um, I could uh, illustrate that. And then I can have these visual callbacks throughout the graphic form. Uh, next slide. Um, and it, the, the, this illustration was a great way to really give the experience of the colonial city, which is again so difficult to do in conventional prose. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is sort of illustrating like the um, the all the different things that would be happening in this vibrant colonial city. Uh, next slide. Um, the colonial dual city. Remember that was my original operating. Um, theory, and not only can I show the images, but also with the graphic format, there's a slightly different color tone. So the, the, the more impoverished, overcrowded um, section of the Vietnamese city has a different color scheme than the French section, which is a lot of greenery and a lot of space. And the artist was able to illustrate that with the different representations of the city, again, with color palette and other visual um, cues. Next slide. One of the really great things that I could show is the linguistic experience. Dual cities, people are speaking multiple languages. 
They're in the same physical proximity. They're bumping shoulders with each other, but they're speaking French or Vietnamese. So it's a different linguistic experience, what you're hearing, right? So the, in the graphic format, people always speak in little, little bubbles with dialogue. So the Vietnamese speak in red hexagons while the uh, French speak in these blue ovals. So it's a visual reminder that even though these people are in the same physical space, they're in different cultural worlds. And that's a really, really sophisticated um, anthropological concept of the colonial dual city. That's tough to explain in conventional prose and then keep reminding people throughout the book. That makes for really sort of belabored writing. Well, in the graphic format, constantly having these reminders that these people are living right next to each other, but they literally cannot understand each other. Uh, next slide. Uh, illustrated colonial injustices and sort of, uh, again, sort of introduce the colonial injustices, but then have these constant reminders that there's prison laborers in the city and always have them in the background. Um, next slide. Yeah, and this is my absolute favorite page of the whole book because it mm. gets at what the historian Milton Osborne talked about in terms of colonial background anxiety. And this is very similar to um, um, the history of the American South in, in Antebellum, um, the anxiety about enslaved people working as domestic servants uh, in the home or on plantations, and that idea that slave owners um, enjoyed the privilege of having enslaved people serve them, but they were always very anxious because the enslaved person could try to revolt, could try to kill you. So it gives uh, the that that kind of power over someone is you know is a, is, is a form of white supremacy and this incredible level of privilege, but it also creates a background anxiety. I think there's a very similar historical parallel between the use of domestic servants in colonial Vietnam. And there's this constant state of anxiety and observation. It's almost like Gothic from Gothic literature with people watching each other. So if you look at who's watching who, um, the, uh, the servants are watching the, um, the owners of the villa and that some of the owners of the villa are watching the servants. And there's all sorts of visual things the artist was able to illustrate that I, I, I found just absolutely amazing. Again, Mike, I can write a whole article on this. It would take me 10, 15 pages. Mike, it may interest you to it may interest you to know that the diarist Mary Chestnut. Yeah. Uh, she said that during the Civil War, she lived in South Carolina, I believe. And she said that during the Civil War, they began speaking French. Uh, because they were at the dinner table as she, and I think she put, I'm paraphrasing here, but something along the lines of, we wanted to use France against Africa, referring to her slaves, maybe using conversations that they overheard to get onto the, uh, slave grapevine or rumor mill, which was quite extensive in the antebellum South. So I, I thought that I'd add that in, if you don't mind. Ab absolutely. A hundred percent. Thank you. I mean, these, these historical parallels are so, so amazing. Um, right. and, and of course, there, there's similar things that happen in, in say, English literature and Gothic literature, uh, right. servants in the home and so forth. Right. But in, in the conditions of slavery or in the conditions of high imperialism, it's even more accentuated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so excellent. Um, and just to finish up here, the next couple of slides show that um, it's a really good way to do um, um, urban history as a global context. or uh, sorry, uh, global is sort of the global and the local merging them two together. So with the visual medium, it's very easy to adjust the focus in and out. We're talking about Hanoi, but in a world historical context. In academic prose, that's that's complicated. But in the visual format, we can pan in and out. So this page takes us to this very Hanoi scene of three workers hanging out enjoying a water pipe, uh, tobacco. I assure you. Um, and it pans out to a global discussion of uh, labor patterns. Um, next page, or next slide. Um, if you ever read Kenneth Pomerantz's wonderful mm -hmm. book, The Great Divergence, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful book, but it is thick economic history. Boy, I, I teach it to my grad students, it is thick. But this is 
the great divergence in two comic pages. Like I, I, I distilled the essence there and the visual format that you can get so much done and, and with a higher level, a high level of sophistication in far fewer pages. Uh, next format or next um, slide. Uh, the opium war next next slide. I'll just finish up here. Um, uh, global labor flows again, really complicated stuff, but tough to uh, to talk about. Um, and this is important uh, for uh, the history of pandemics because with the flow of labor, there's always the possibility of the flow of disease. If we could just skip quickly through these next few slides because they're um, just sort of illustrating these uh, again these big world history things. I was able to demonstrate very quickly. Next slide. Um, epidemiology, a uh, history of disease, open up any medical textbook and there's lots of images. Open up most history monographs, there's very few images because they're expensive, right? One, if you're doing graphic format, you've already blown through that. You're already, there's gonna be lots of images. My father was a professor at a medical school, so I, I just borrowed his old medical textbooks and was able to uh, guide the artist on how to illustrate the disease cycle in basic epidemiology. Next slide. Uh, urban ecology, uh, very, again, very easy to illustrate. I could put all my maps, remember? I loved all those maps. They go right into the shape of the book. Uh, next slide. We're almost done here. Um, and then for teaching, uh, and this, I, what I wanted to do is show the craft of a historian and show how I worked with the primary sources. So I was able to have the artist literally put the primary sources into the images. So in the next slide, you see the, uh, the translation of a document, a couple of documents I was working with, but I, I translated them, but gave her photographs of the original. So these would originally be in French, but that's the stuff I was working with in the archives. So it allows the reader to have a little window into the craft, the methodology of historians. So third part would be the shortest part. Uh, next slide. What does all this mean today? What have we learned? Well, we're speaking in the COVID world, so I've got to address this now. And people are finally listening to me about me ranting on about disease. But um, human activity creates pandemic. Don't blame the poor viruses. The virus is just doing its own thing, right? Viruses are just doing their own things. It's human agency that creates pandemics by creating systems of transportation, by creating urbanization, uh, city centers. Any time in world history where we have these breakthroughs in long distance transportation, they're followed by pandemics. So um, uh, trade connections between Han China and the Roman Empire within a few years, pandemics move back and forth. The Columbian exchange, the Iberians coming to the Americas, the, the horrifying pandemics that decimated the indigenous population. And for uh, purposes of my book, in the late 19th, early 20th century, industrialized global transportation, steamships and railways, a pandemic follows right away. Uh, actually two, both bubonic plague and cholera. So transportation and urbanization are social um, processes. They're created by human beings that facilitate pandemics. So it, it, again, it's human agency here. Also, another point that I, I look, addressed in the book and, and um, with my, my Vietnamese outsmarting the French authorities by catching the rats and cutting off their tails and various other ways that they circumvented public health measures. Well, public health measures are always to a certain degree authoritarian. It's this balance between the public good and individual liberty. I don't know. Maybe you all in Texas have been discussing this lately. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if that's been a, a statewide debate in Texas, but public health is always this balance between the individual and the public good. And it's the state, it's the government that uh, has to decide that. And this opens up all sorts of important political and philosophical discussions. And then finally, I find that people will always try to resist public health policies because by definition, they're invasive. So as the resistance to various public health measures over the past uh, year and a half have played out in the United States, I've seen so many parallels to my Vietnamese um, uh, Hanoi residents resisting French public health measures because they viewed them as illegitimate, as imposed by the French. 
and thus questioned uh, the public health measures. Um, my final point, uh, which I uh, actually was on the slide I was going to show, was be curious, be creative, read broadly, read outside your discipline. My whole project here was about me stemmed from me getting bored in the archives and reading broadly, reading anthropology. And that's where my inspiration for my historical work came from. Me getting bored in the archives and finding curious things in the archives to keep my mind going. And then actually finding out that the real story was maybe in the dossier called Destruction of Animals in the City, not in all those darn tax records that were putting me to sleep. I went a little bit long. I'm sorry. I get excited when I talk about this stuff because it's super fun. It's okay. All right. So hopefully let me check the chat box here. Okay. We've uh, all right. So let me start with, uh, with a question from uh, Steve. Uh, have you or your colleagues assigned graphic histories in your history classes? If so, which ones and with what level of success? Yeah, so um, there's a number of excellent graphic histories. Um, the, the Oxford series has some fantastic ones. Um, I particularly like Abina and the Important Men, which was the first in the Oxford series. And it's about a West African woman in the 1870s who was enslaved by an African man. And then she went to the British colonial courts and used the colonial courts to sue for her freedom. And this upends so many things we think we know about colonial power, about race, about gender. And it's this really amazing story. Um, there's also um, a fantastic book on the murder of Emmett Till. Yeah. Uh, that uh, is really a really powerful story that links um, what's going on in the South with what's going on in Chicago. Um, there's another book called, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name, but it's um, it's about the first African American governor of Louisiana, and this is in Reconstruction, and it's about the various possibilities, historical possibilities that could have happened in the South during Reconstruction, which are of course all sort of shut down after what the Compromise in 1877. I'm I'm out of my league here. I'm not an Americanist, so, <laughs> but um, I'll, I also want to say that. I don't think everything should be in graphic format. Uh, I've, I will not name names, but I've seen some real um, stinker graphic histories. Yeah. I find that frequently intellectual history doesn't lend itself well. Yeah. Um, there's a book on Rosa, uh, well, no, there's a book on um, Hannah Arendt, uh, one of the great political scientists of the 20th century. Um, uh, that is is not that great. It's 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 caricatures of people's faces talking to each other with huge amounts of text. So if you ever look at a graphic history, you need to ask why is this in graphic format? What what is the author doing with the visual medium that would be more difficult in conventional prose? Um, so I think Abina does that. That was that was sort of my main motivating uh, sort of guideline. You know what? Why put this in graphic format? Every page. Why is this a cartoon? Why is right. it just a paragraph of prose? So I've I've used them. Great success. Um, by the way, I started teaching in the 1990s. A little gray in the beard. Um, and the first time I taught, I taught Mouse Art Spiegelman's graphic yeah. memoir of his father's survival of the Holocaust or Shoah. Uh, Mouse, I think, is sort of the the ur text. Uh, Mouse Art Spiegelman's Mouse is just absolutely fabulous. Uh, okay, here's a question from Autumn. Mike, uh, she wants to know about the rats. Uh, when they found out that they had a rat farm, what happened to all those rats in the farm? Did they kill them? You know what? That's a good question. And you know, I'm I'm literally a prisoner of the archives, meaning that when I'm doing research, I sit in the archive all day. But also, I can only work with what the ar archives give me, and archives are very incomplete. So. We just know that they found the rat farm. I assume they tried to shut it down, but we don't know. Um, and um, there's there's a lot of unanswered questions. And unfortunately, we don't have any Vietnamese sources on this because you know the the Vietnamese rat farmers or the Vietnamese rat smugglers, they're not going to put anything in print, right? Because that would be incriminating. So anytime you're doing the history of 
criminality or people trying to evade the rules, it's really difficult to yeah. find proper archival sources. Yeah. I've, been, yeah. I've been watching The Sopranos, for example, and it's very charming the way they always go to make calls at the cell phone, uh, at, or not the cell phone, the um, it's before cell phones are coming, uh, at pay phones. Again, your kids may not know this, but there used to be these things called pay phones where, where people would touch a stranger's phone and put money in um, as, as a way of evading the official record. So when I watch The Sopranos and I see that, I'm thinking like a historian. I'm like, darn, you know, Tony Soprano calling up Christopher isn't going to be in the archival record. You know, right. what else do we see going on in our day to day life that there'll be no official record of? And that makes it very difficult for historians of the future. Okay, next question is, uh, Jose wants to know, why did the French believe that their form of imperialism benefited the Vietnamese? What, you know, what, what did they, why did, what did they think they were doing that was so good? Yeah, so um, this is, you know, the era of the legacy of the French Revolution, uh, where the French really believed that they had implemented the ideas of the Enlightenment. This is under the period of the French Third Republic which admittedly was the most progressive constitution in Europe. And um, it gets at this French paradox. Um, you know, there's a lot of French paradoxes. How can they eat such fatty food yet look so thin and good? Um, uh, but another French paradox is they have this belief in these universal principles of really what we would recognize as the best ideas of the Enlightenment about freedom, equality, and so forth. Yet they spread these at the barrel of a gun around the colonial world. And so they conquer huge swaths of Africa, huge amounts of territory in Asia and islands in the Pacific in the name of the ideas of the French Enlightenment. And it becomes a real problem when they start to build schools. Because if you read French uh, school curriculum, it's about all about revolution and revolutionary ideas. Yeah. Rousseau, Voltaire, how do you, like I, I've seen the, the government reports of a local administrator saying, Hey, the French schools are teaching the Vietnamese Voltaire. This is maybe a bad idea because they're going to get those ideas that led our great grandfathers to revolt against the king. So there's this, this paradox here and it gets to a larger issue and, it, and this intersects with American history. I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. I've got family and friend from the, the Philippines areas that are, were colonized by the United States. Um, how does a republic have a colonial empire? You know, it's one thing for a monarchy to have a colonial empire, but a republic, how does democracy have an empire? And in some ways, it, it's, it's just impossible, and it eventually will collapse. But it, 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 the, next, the next question is from Faith. Um, she actually has kind of a couple of questions, but uh, did they completely get rid of the rats? No. And then, <laughs> yeah, and, and then the next question is, what graphic novel was it? Uh, was it Mouse, or what histories most inspired you? Was it the Cat Massacre, those sorts of yeah. cheese and worms, those sorts of thing books? Yeah, um, the for thick description, the Balinese cockfight. Um, I mean, that's just just an incredible, incredible sort of methodological light bulb moment for me. Um, Mouse, in terms of the graphic format, absolutely one hundred percent. Art Spiegelman's wonderful, and 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 yes, you are. Um, they did not kill all the rats. When I was working in the archives, um, I had to be careful because there were a couple rats living in one of those card catalogs, um, uh. which makes me now appreciate the computerized uh, system they have in the Vietnamese archives. And I used question, to Mike, um, and this is, uh, how did you find your artist? And can you describe the collaboration? Yeah, fortunately, uh, I, I went to Oxford and they had Liz Clark who'd done most of the volumes in the Oxford series. And she's incredible. She's an absolute genius. And, you know, surprise, surprise, I didn't learn much comic theory in graduate school. I learned urban history and I learned um, race theory and so forth. So I had to teach myself. I mean, I, I felt like a child at the adults table at Thanksgiving, trying to talk to Liz Clark about the graphic format. So poor me, I had to spend six months on the couch reading comic books. And my <laughs> wife would come in and yell at me and go, why aren't you working? I'm like, I'm working. I'm, I'm studying the, the, the graphic medium. So I, I read comic theory. I read widely. Um, Alan Moore, who wrote The Watchmen, um, and also From Hell, which is his history of Jack the Ripper, 
which actually has about 40 pages of footnotes at the end or endnotes. Um, it's a serious historical work. He's totally wrong, but it's a serious historical work. So I really drew from the greats. And then I had Liz teach me uh, the jargon and, and what could be done. Um, I've worked on film previously, so I had a bit of sort of a, a cinematic sort of way of thinking that I think lent itself well. But um, uh, the way it would work is I would write out a sheet with what the what image I wanted, um, what uh, action would be happening, and what any text there would be in terms of dialogue or narration, and send that sheet with a folder full of images, photographs, maps, and so forth, lithographs, off to Liz, who would then render this into the graphic page. Uh, it, was, it was a real collaboration, but the true genius lies with Liz. I mean, she's just amazing. And one thing I wanna say is that the history of cartoons and racism is a very difficult and very problematic history. Uh, there's a whole bunch of Walt Disney cartoons that they put in the vault they don't want you to see that are full of racist caricatures. Look at the history of why Mickey Mouse wears white gloves because it cut the cartoons come from the history of the minstrel shows. Um, so I know that there's a lot of either uh, purposeful or inadvertent racial blunders with cartoons. And I was really wanted to make sure that um, uh, particularly the Vietnamese and Chinese were represented in their full humanity. And I think that Liz did a wonderful job because frequently and sometimes in the writing about colonialism, uh, the white folks are at the center and the Vietnamese are bit players, are sort of in the background. And I wanted to avoid that. I think Liz and I did, did accomplish that goal, but that was a real concern with this particular genre. Well, we'll close with that. And I'll tell you, Steve Davis, one of our history professors who's using the book in his class, he says, tell Mike that my students love the book. I just graded a batch of essays on various aspects of it and they love the book. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for reading the book. Thank you for listening to me rant on and on about uh, my, my much beloved rats. <laughs> thank you, Mike. And thank everyone for attending today. What a wonderful uh, way to spend a lunch hour, right? And don't forget in two weeks, we'll talk about viruses again and how that might relate to economics. So thank everyone and goodbye. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.